Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak Ala Sayyidina wa Nabiina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa atba'ihi ila yawm al-deen Allahumma faqihna fi al-deen Wa alimna al-ta'wil Wa alhimna rushdana ya Rabbil Alameen Alhamdulillah In our lessons on Imam Birgivis At-Tariq al-Muhammadiyya we have, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, finished the section on the attainment of taqwa with respect to the essential limb, which is the heart. Now we've been looking at some of the virtuous traits that have been praised in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, but which were not explicitly addressed when we looked at the blameworthy traits of the heart. Right? And... These are often comprehensive traits that were only mentioned incidentally. Last class, we looked at reflection, tafakkur. And Imam Birgivi mentioned some of the principles of reflection, and that's a very important lesson. Right? Because without reflection, without fikr, the heart is immersed in darkness. And the beginning of change in the believer's heart arises by beginning to reflect on one state. Right? By beginning to reflect on one state. Today, we're going to look at one of the other comprehensive virtues of the religion. Right? If anything, it is the religion itself, which is a sidq, right? which is to be true. Right? Now, very often, Sidq is mentioned with Ikhlas because they are complementary. Ikhlas is to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right, in one's actions. And we looked extensively at what that means earlier in our look at the opposite of insincerity, of riya, And there's sincerity in our acts of devotion, in our ibadat, and there it's obligatory. But also sincerity in our worldly actions is highly encouraged. Both because it turns our acts of worship into actions worthy or open to reward, makes them transformative. But also it safeguards one's worldly actions from causing one to drift into worldliness, dunya. Right? Because worldliness, dunya, is kullu ma shagalaka anillahi ta'ala, is everything that busies you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that you do with an intention for Allah is not dunya, is not worldly. Because there's an intention in it for Allah. But that intention, besides being a means of attaining reward, right, is also a safeguard from drifting into worldliness. There's an interrelationship between sincerity and sidq, and being true. Sidq, Imam Al-Birgivi here, because he's mentioning these virtues in summary, does not give us a definition of it. And the ulama have defined it in various ways. Right? But sidq right, is for one matter to be true with respect to another. So some of the ulama define sidq as being that for one's outward to correspond to one's inward, and one's inward to correspond to one's outward. Right? Right. So practically, it's easy to make a claim, right? To make a claim of religiosity. But you make that claim, but then do your actions confirm as true that inward claim that I am religious? Or you make an outward show of religiosity. Right? But 
does your inward intention and state correspond to that outward matter? Right? So that is being true, right? Being true. It is also for one's public actions and conduct to accord with one's private actions and conduct and vice versa. Right? Right? And most especially for one's private conduct to correspond with one's public conduct. It's easy to be religious in public. The test of religiosity is how you are when you are in private. So, so Sidq here, and much can and has been said about Sidq. But here he wants to look at what are being true, right? Because there is, there's being true in words, being true in intentions, being true in one's promises being true in fulfilling one's promises, being true in one's actions, right? Being true in one's states, right? So he gives seven expressions of being true. Right? Right? So, and for those of you who do read one of the excellent discussions on being true on Sidq was given by one of the great scholars and luminaries of our time, Habib Omar bin Hafiz. He has a beautiful work on an introduction to spirituality and the characteristics of its people. And this is capably translated by our dear friend and teacher, Usad Amjad Tarsin. And it's available through Firdos books and others. And he goes through some of the key qualities of the people of spirituality, of tasawwuf, right? And one of the key qualities, that's a fundamental quality of our religion, is this quality of being true. So Imam al-Birgivi rahimahullah ta'ala says, was sidq, right, of the praiseworthy qualities not previously mentioned is being true right and he says wa huwa fi sabr and it is in seven matters to be true fil qawl right and wa huwa diddu al kadhib to be true in one's word is for one's words not to be false right for one's words not to be lies now lies, and we looked at a little bit of this previously when we talked about lying, and we'll be looking at lying when we come to the sins of the, the, the blameworthy traits of the tongue. Lying is not to intend that which is contrary to the truth. Right? Sometimes people imagine that lying is that you intended to say something false. You intended to deceive someone. Right? Intention is not part of a lie. A lie, being truthful, is for one's words to correspond to what, to, to how things are. Right? For one's words to correspond to how things are. Now, when Something is obvious, right? One plus one equals two, right? Or something is just a simple fact that how much did this, you know, you're, you're a businessman. Someone asks, okay, how much did this book cost you? You say, it cost me this much. It's a fact. There's a price that you paid. How much did it cost you? So you say what it cost. But sometimes in life, you're, you, you're not sure of something, then being truthful is to affirm that which you are reasonably sure to be true. You don't have to be certain, right? 
But the safer thing to be truthful is when you're not certain to make it clear. So you say, I think it was this much. I think it was such and such. So you're safe. right? Someone asks you, which way is Cooper's Mosque? Now you get confused about directions. Here at the center, I've, when we moved here, I accidentally prayed to three of the four directions. I think the Qibla is this way. If the Qibla is this way, but I accidentally prayed this way, I accidentally prayed that way, and I prayed the right direction as well. But you need to have a good reason to believe that Cooper's is actually that way, right? which is th the case. right? Now, a lot of people fail to be truthful in their words for many reasons. And we'll be looking at this more extensively because one of the gravest sins of the tongue is to lie. That there's sometimes it's obvious. There's a, the obvious lie, which is when you know something is untrue, but you say it anyways. Someone asks you um, about which way is Cooper's Mosque, but you don't want them to go there. So you say, I don't know. That's a lie. It's an obvious lie because you know it to be the contrary. But one of the types of lie that is contrary to being true is when you affirm something is true when you don't have good reason to believe it is the case. How? Someone asks you for a fact, but you tell them an opinion, right? Someone asks you, what is the best restaurant? What's the best halal restaurant in Canada? Right. Now, it's a matter of opinion. But if you state a fact, then do you have a basis for saying that it is such and such? If you don't, practical caution being true is to be careful. That when you give an opinion, you make it sure, make it clear it's an opinion. Let's say you think that Munir's Karahi is the best, or Munir's Mensaf. You think it's the best halal restaurant in Canada. Munir's Mensaf. Then the safety, if you want to be true in your word, is when you're giving an opinion, make it clear it's your opinion. You say, I think the best restaurant is such and such. So it's my opinion. You're not saying it's a fact. If you're saying a fact, then there should be some reason to back it up. Are you an expert in halal restaurants? No. Do you know all the halal restaurants? No. It's an opinion. It's not a fact. So one of the common ways that people make mistakes is that they make an say an opinion as a fact. Now, are you an expert in this field? No. Do you have, comp have you done a complete survey of the matter? No. And sometimes it's innocent. It doesn't really matter what's the best restaurant in, what's the best halal restaurant, but let's say somebody wants to buy a car for their son who's entering university. So they ask, what's a good, What's the best budget car I can buy for my son? You don't know anything about cars. You say that such and such brand of car. Said those are the best cars. You could be you could say something correct, but it could well be a lie. Why? It's a, it's an accidental truth, and a lot of the ulama differed. That is an accidental truth, a true. True or a lie. Why? Because you didn't have a good reason to believe it was true. So it's better to express your opinions as opinions. That, well, I have had a good experience with Toyotas or whatever. You give your opinion. 
But even with opinions, you should be careful. Why? Because they, because we know the Prophet ﷺ said, al mustasharu mu'taman. The one consulted has been trusted. And if you're not an expert, maybe when you bought your car 10 years ago, that company was good, but now they're expensive and unreliable. So were you, so even though it was an opinion, were you true in your nusih, in your sincere concern for the other person's good? No. So being true in word entails being careful about when you state a fact and when you give an opinion. But even when you give an opinion, to be careful because your opinion could be taken as a fact and it could be trusted. Right? Let's say that someone asks you, is there any good halal meat store in Mississauga? You say there are none. Let's just say, Maybe a lie because there are several. Number two, there may be consequences. Someone says, well, if there are no halal uh, meat stores here, then I, don't, I, I should just eat supermarket meat. Right? It's better just to say, I'm, I don't know any. E even better is to point them to someone else who knows. So many things we say can be lies when you have no reason to believe it's true or dangerous speech, which is contrary to being true in words. Because being truthful in word, also being true in word is also that to be careful that what you say is not just right, but it is good for the other person. Which is from the many insights the ulama tell us of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam saying, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أو, أو ليصمت. Whoever believes in Allah and Allah said, let them say the good, which is something you have good reason to believe will be of benefit to the person who says it. It might be true, but it may not be of benefit to the other person. It might hurt them actually. Right? might hurt them. And... He'll give us many examples of that. And that's of the things to consider in speech. That it is, is it true? But also, is it of benefit? Is it of benefit? So, sidq in speech is not to lie, but also not to say something that may be of harm to the one who asks you. Right? It could be of this dunya we harm, Someone, you know, let's say you're a teacher, right? But, you know, or let's say you have a very successful date business. So you like going to a very nice place. There's this person who has a very premium steakhouse and they're very religious. You say a, an excellent, you know, a, rec a restaurant I recommend is... Hajji's Steaks. You're, you're a wealthy businessman and you're, you're the fiqh teacher for this 16-year-old. 16-year-old goes to Hajji's Steaks and he pays $80 for Hajji's Steaks. On his mother's debit card. Right? Was that the right thing for, the, for that person to do? No. Right? That's, a, that's a bit of a dunya we harm. Right? But sometimes you may say something that is true in a matter of religion. And it's not the right thing to tell the person. Because right? it may be true, but they're not ready for that. Because you don't know that this person has waswasa. You tell them that thing, it will confuse them. Right? So part of being true in speech is to be careful of what you say. Consider before you speak. Right? You're careful that it is true, but it's also worthy of being trusted. Right? Worthy of being trusted. And when you're not sure, say, I don't know. Say, I don't know. Even in worldly matters. Right? 
That's in words, being true in words. Wafinia, right? And being true in intention, al ikhlas is sincerity, right? Which is that in our acts of devotion, in our ibadat, you make your intention before you start the action whether prayer or fasting or zakat or hajj or whatever it is or Quran or anything that you seek the pleasure of Allah before you begin. Right? But also being true in intention relates to our worldly acts where it's recommended that you seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before it so that why are you going to work? Before you head out, make a habit. Pause for a moment and make the intention, I'm doing this for the sake of Allah, seeking Allah's pleasure, seeking, and you think of good intentions, just a moment. It's seeking to earn a lawful living, seeking to provide for my family in permissible ways, seeking to worship Allah in the hustle and bustle of life. Seeking to remember Allah in places where others don't remember Him. Seeking to uphold good character. Seeking to act upon the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Seeking to be a caller to Allah by my conduct and character and state. right? And many other intentions. So your entire work becomes a ibadah. You drive your car for the sake of Allah. You make high intentions. Before you enter the supermarket, why are you going shopping? Very simple. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because why are you shopping? What do you do when you go to the grocery store? Buy food. But what is the food? It's a blessing from Allah. Who are you buying the food for? For your family. Why are you buying it for them? Because you're, Allah has made you responsible for them. Do you buy just the cheapest food only? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> I'm the, I love the Afghanis. <laughs> yeah. No, but do you try to buy something your wife likes once in a while? Yes, right? So you're trying to buy at least some things that your family likes. Right? If you buy cereal your kids don't like, are they going to eat it? And I know your kids, right? Yeah. So you have good intentions, right? So you think there's so many intentions, right? If you stand in the supermarket and see when people are walking, it's like the walking dead, right? They are buying Allah's blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you look like they're being punished. Why? Because they're shopping without intention. The money they have, whether in their wallet or their bank account, is a blessing from Allah. The work that they got the money from is a blessing from Allah. The opportunity that in one place you have all these things gathered for you. Right? Supermarkets are a blessing from Allah. Now, we're not responsible for their practices and all these things. It's a blessing. Just imagine what you'd have to do a hundred years ago to gather all these things. You have fruits from every season. One of the great scholars of Damascus, Sheikh Mustafa Turkmani, uh, we were having l lunch with him during a, like a picnic outside Damascus. And he s said, we, you know, our state has become better than the states of kings of old. The Quran mentions miracles for the past peoples that Allah brought for them fruit from every season. Now you don't have to wait for a miracle. Just go to your local grocer and you have fruit from every season. Now that was in Damascus. Here you have fruit not only from every season but from every land in the world. Do you want Indian mangoes or do you want Pakistani mangoes or do you want Bangladeshi mangoes or do you want Jamaican mangoes or God forbid, do you want Mexican mangoes? They're all there. Right? They're all there. Now, some of them are very expensive, but it's all there in one place. If anything, people complain there's too much selection. But there's all kinds of blessings. 
So you do everything with intention, right? And that's part of being true. There's an obligatory trueness in intention, which is our ibadat. There's a recommended trueness in intention, which is in every other aspect of our lives. Then there's a very serious matter. The third aspect of intention, he says, third and fourth is وَفِي الْوَعْدِ وَالْعَزْمِ Right? And also in one's promises and one's resolve. To be true in one's promise and resolved. Hmm? And to be true in them is قُوَّتُهُمَا وَخُلُوهُمَا مِنَ الضَّعْفِ وَالتَّرَدُّدِ Right? To be true in one's promise and in one's resolve is for them to be strong and to be free of weakness or wavering. Meaning that if you make a promise, you are, you are firm and strong that you will fulfill it. How? The Mashaykh mentioned that this has two elements that do not make a promise or a commitment unless two things are found. But both are required. When you make a promise, a wa'ad, firstly, you need to have the firm resolve that you will fulfill it. But that's not enough. That's necessary, but not sufficient. That you have the firm resolve that you will fulfill it. But the second is that you need to be reasonably sure that you will, in fact, be able to fulfill it. A lot of times people say, yes, 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 yes. But then if you think about it, there's no way you can do it. Someone says, um, can you come Saturday afternoon? Say, yeah, for sure, I'll be there. And you have the full resolve that you'll do it. But then turns out that it's your anniversary and your wife has booked a for, for the two of you to go to her favorite restaurant where you haven't taken her since COVID began. Right? Now, if you fulfill that promise that, yes, I'll definitely be at this appointment on Saturday, what's going to happen? If you're recently married, it might end up in divorce. <laughs> or if you've been married for a long time, you'll have weeks of complaining. So, but said, but when I made the intention, when I made the promise, I was going to fulfill it. No, you weren't. Because you had the resolve to fulfill it, but you didn't think, can I fulfill it? Right? Someone says, um, I need to borrow money. Said, come tomorrow, I'll give you the $5,000. But he didn't pause to think, do I have $5,000 in the bank that I can give? No. So, having the resolve is necessary but not sufficient. You have to have the resolve, the azam, and also غلبت الظن. Right? You have to be reasonably sure. بالقدرة على الوفاء That you'll be able to fulfill. If you don't, what do you do? Some people say, well, I didn't want to disappoint them. No. Being true in your promise is that you say, you know, your friend says, um, can I borrow $5,000 from you? He said, I'd love to lend you the money, let me check if I'm able to. I'll get back to you tonight. Let me get back to you tomorrow. And then when you're thinking about it, you remember that you're married. And that's the shared bank account. And if you lend $5,000, there'll be problems. Which is why the scholars say, always keep some, have some money that your spouse does not know about. And it, this, I learned this from one of the, the, the scholars who kept two accounts. One that his wife knew about, but another one which is where he bought his books from. He had an 80-20 rule. There's one of the scholars in Jordan. 20% of his books he got from his main bank account. And he got a bit of trouble for that. Why did you buy these books, etc.? 80% of his books he bought from another account his wife did not know about. Right? Right? Because avoiding harm is given precedence over achieving benefit. Right? So you need to be careful. Right? 
in your promises, right? That don't make a promise you can't keep. That's one aspect, right? And likewise in a resolve. When you make a resolve, whether for another, but also with yourself, with yourself, you know, make a commitment with another, don't make a commitment, because a commitment's like a promise. But a resolve you make with yourself is like a promise to yourself. Don't make a promise unless you're committed to keep it. There's these, this young German guy, he came by, Amman, very excited. He was traveling the Middle East, visiting shuyukh. Each one he'd ask for advice and this and this. Said, give me dhikr I can do, advice I can act upon. So I was with this Jordanian Bedouin, Hajj Kamal, from the Abadi tribe. He's Bedouin. Actually, Hajj Kamal was born in a cave in Amman. I, I visited his house, his family house, next to his cave. Amman's full of hills, and many of the Bedouins, even though they had houses, in winter they used to stay in their caves, in the city. Why? Because the caves in the ground would stay warm. And in some Arab countries, they've mastered the art of refrigeration in housing. That it'll be colder in the house than outside the house in winter. It's amazing engineering. Right? <laughs> but by accident. Right? Whereas the old houses are warm in winter and cool in the summer. These would be hot in the summer and freezing in the winter. Really amazing feat of modern technology, mashallah. Anyways, Hajj Kamal was sitting there. He heard this German brother say, what can I do, this and that? He said, look, irham nafsak, have mercy on yourself. Don't commit to more than you have to. Then one day, if you have some extra time, he said, sit in a corner. On Saturday, if your family went to, to your in-laws, whatever, you're free in the morning, do six hours of salah on the Prophet ﷺ. But don't make a commitment that every Saturday I'm going to do 50,000 salawat on the Prophet ﷺ. Unless, same thing, you have the resolve to do it, but also are you sure that you'll be able to fulfill that resolve? Now when it has to do with other people, because it becomes an... Um, you need a responsibility to fulfill because they're relying on you. But with respect to yourself, otherwise you lose the will, the irada of doing the good. Because then it becomes a weak in intention. It's better. That's why the Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala relates, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ سَلَمْ إِذَا عَمِلَ عَمَلًا أَثْبَتَهُ and the Messenger of Allah if you did something, he'd make it a firm practice. Because he acted وسلم, with consideration. Right? So that's in promises and resolves. The fifth test of being true, he says, وَفِي الْوَفَاءِ تَحْقِيقُهُ وَإِنْجَازُهُ عَلَى وُفْقِ الْوَعْدِ وَالْعَزْبِ And in fulfilling one's promise and one's resolve is to realize it and fulfill it in accordance with the promise and the resolve. Right? Because now we look at promises and their fulfillment when we look at the fiqh of, of, of words, but we have been called upon to fulfill our promises. Right? Now, if you regularly don't fulfill your promises, it indicates that Something was wrong when you made the promise. Now it's possible that things change. It's possible that things change. That Sidi Kamal, for example, promised that I'll help you move on Saturday. But let's say his best friend had a heart attack and he needs to go to hospital. He said, no, no, no. You take an Uber, this guy's not like barely able to breathe. Do you go and help somebody move their books? No, but you feel bad, right? But normally, a sign that your promise 
was made properly is that you would fulfill it. Right? Even if a little bit difficult. And if you can't fulfill it directly, you fulfill it indirectly. How? For example, if you made a promise you'll help somebody move, you couldn't. But you tell your best friend that, oh, by the way, I was going to help this brother move, really nice guy, this and that. How could you help him move? Or you tell your circle of friends, guys, there's one of the brothers. Um, I was going to help them move, but I have a bit of an emergency. Who can help them? So instead of you going, three people showed up. Right? And the believer is somebody who is concerned about not only making promises that are true, but fulfilling their promise. And even when difficult, they take all the means to try to be able to fulfill it. And sometimes, you know, there's a saying that قَلِيلُ عِلْمٍ أَضَرُّ مِنْ كَثِيرِ جَهَلٍ A little bit of knowledge can be more harmful than a lot of ignorance. Someone says, oh, but I read in the books of fiqh that fulfilling promises is only recommended. Firstly, it's only recommended. Fulfilling promises is sunnah. Right? But it, in many circumstances, it could be wajib. Particularly if someone is relying upon you, right? You told the local baker that, you know, um, if you bake me 500 uh, pita breads, I'll buy them from you tomorrow morning. The guy stays up all night. There's no contract between you. You didn't even set up the price. But the guy stayed up all night making you 500 pita breads. Uh, you know what? I changed my mind. Right? Now, historically, that was almost inconceivable. It was almost inconceivable because... Your honor is your word. Right? Your honor is your word. Right? I had a friend, subhanAllah, he died in a, in a car crash just a few years ago. May Allah have mercy on him from, from Aleppo. When uh, he was living in Jordan, um, when the U.S. invaded Iraq, um, and his family were traders in whole grains in the market in, in Aleppo. But they weren't a wealthy family. They would have people who had invested and they would buy grains and they would trade in them and they would keep their profit for, you know, for, the, for their work and the investors would get their capital back. They had bought over a million US dollars worth of grain in northern Iraq, all from other people's investment. And then, when the U.S. invaded, etc., they let the looters steal those grain stores. So all the grain was stolen. So he is telling me that, you know, my... He wasn't able to go back to Syria for different political reasons. He said, my family got, has gathered together. It was like a match commentary. And they've all agreed that they're going to sell off because it was partnership of his father and his brothers. They're going to sell several houses and the women are going to sell their, ju their jewelry. Why? To pay off the investors. I said, but you don't have to do that. Sharan, you don't. The investor's money was lost. You didn't lose it. Fiqh-wise, nothing is due. He said, we, we buy and sell and we trade on our good word. We made a commitment that we're going to take this money, invest it, give you back the money, and we'll give you profit. Right? That is our, that's our name. So they didn't have to give the money back. But they sold off properties and did this and that. And they gave the money in full. Actually, even the investors weren't looking for it. Two years later, those same investors gave twice the amount of investment when things settled down. Right? That is fulfilling one's commitments. Right? Even if it's somewhat difficult. Right? Whereas someone who regularly does not fulfill their commitments... The Prophet ﷺ referred to it as it being a sign of hypocrisy. Now, it's not to self-blame. 
right? That, oh, maybe I'm a hypocrite. No. The thing is, you reflect and you take yourself to account. Am I someone who doesn't fulfill their commitments? Other types of false knowledge, some people say, well, I said, inshallah. So it's not a, it's not a promise. That's, that's ilmun la yanfa. That's knowledge that does not benefit. Because what does the other person understand from you? When you said, I, I'll be there on Saturday, inshallah. What do they understand? That you won't be there? That you'll be there. Right? And that's why sometimes there are some religious people who use knowledge in harmful ways. And they behave worse than non-religious people. Because the person who doesn't know anything about the deen, they said, I gave my word. It's my honor. I'm going to stick with it. The, the religious person half-baked knowledge. They say, oh, but if you say, inshallah, it's not a promise, blah, 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 blah. Okay, okay, that's what some text says. What does it mean? Right? So be careful. Right? Because not fulfilling your promises is a branch of hypocrisy, of being insincere, untrue. Right? But also, practically, the ulama say you should, there are some places you shouldn't say, inshallah. When you make a commitment, make the commitment firm, pause, and then say, inshallah. So it's clearly firm. Say, I will, I will be there on Saturday. Pause. So it's a firm commitment. If you intend to be there, make a firm promise, and then say, inshallah. By inshallah, you mean that unless something comes up, that's outside my control. But you made a firm commitment. Right? Just like in dua, you don't say inshallah. Right? You don't say, Allahumma ghfir li in shit. No. When you make dua, you make it firm. When you make a promise, you make the promise firm. And then you leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you intend not if, because it's not if Allah wills, you're saying if I will. Right? So I'm going to say, oh, it's Saturday morning, you're tired. So, oh, I said inshallah. That's not inshallah. That was in shi'tuana. Right? So don't. Right? And that's why it's very important that you don't take knowledge just from books without understanding how you apply it. Because otherwise people mess up all kinds of things. Right? Mess up all. That apply like the... I, yeah, so, so there, and, and in some societies, it's a bad habit. When people say inshallah means it's not happening. And it leads to difference, right? I've seen arguments in some countries say, don't say inshallah. Everything's in the... Right? So if you want to make... Firstly, don't, be, don't rush to make a commitment. They say, let me get back to you. Let me get back to you. But if you make a promise... Make it firm. Right? Right? And then take the means of fulfilling, even if difficult. And one of the practical things that Mashaikh say, when it's difficult to fulfill promise, a sign of being sincere is either to facilitate this, the action for the person or if you can't even do that, suggest ways that they could do it, right? For example, say, um, look, something urgent came up. Would you be able to, to wait till 12.30? I can come and help you at that time, for example. I said, oh, yeah, I, actually, I'll be moving all the way till 5 p.m. I'd appreciate your help at that time, right? So never take promises lightly. That's part of being true. وَفِي نَحْوِ الْخَوْفِ قُوَّتُهُ وَكَثْرَتُهُ And in the like of fear, being true in fear, in awe of Allah, is the sign of it's true that it's strong and plentiful. Sorry? Sorry, I missed one. وَفِي الْعَمَلِ مُوَافَقَتُهُ لِلْبَاطِنِ وَعَدَمُ دِلَالَتِهِ عَلَى أَمْرٍ لَمْ يَتَّصِفْ بِهِ Right? And being true in action is for your action, your 
meaning your outward action, to correspond to your inward. And it not indicate, meaning your action not indicate something that you are not inwardly characterized by. How? That, for example, you went to the masjid, you're done. You did your sunnah. And you see that brother Bashir is still praying. And a few young guys are looking at Bashir. So you go, okay, who, do, what, who does this Bashir guy think he is anyways? So you go and stand closer to the mihrab. And you say, okay, Allahu Akbar. Right? Now you say, okay, Bashir was praying, but he was praying a little fast. So you're going to pray. And Bashir has a bad back. So you're praying with longer rukur, with a straighter back. Right? And you move your head a little bit to look like it's quiet prayer, but you are in reflection on what you're reciting. So it looks like, mashallah, he's praying long. Right? He's making long rukur. He seems to be enjoying the prayer. But does the outward action correspond to your inward? Which is, you're kind of hoping that they're seeing you. No. That's insincerity and hypocrisy. Right? And it should not indicate something that you're not characterized by. Now, does this mean that if you see your friend praying, that you shouldn't pray as well? But what do you do? Yeah, you make your intention first, right? So you're walking away. You don't normally do your nafil. You, you just do the sunnah, the, the sunnah prayer and that's it. The emphasized sunnah, sunnah muakkadah. But you're walking away, you see Bashir praying his nafil. So that's, you shouldn't leave anything of the good if you find an inclination to it. So do it, but just pause for an, a moment and make an intention for the sake of Allah. And if you fear insincerity, because it, Bashir and you were both teaching the youth. So what do you do? You make a dua to yourself. Oh Allah, make this. Allahumma ja'al hadha khalisan li wajhik al kareem Wahfathni min al-riya. Oh Allah, make this purely for your sake. And protect me from showing off. And if you ask Allah, inshallah, you would only ask Allah if you were seriously seeking it. Right? That's one way of protecting your action. But if you get an inclination of good, don't leave it. Don't do it for the insincere intention. So, you know, your friend gave, there's a fundraiser for the Uyghur community. So your friend gave $10,000. Your nafs says, who does he think he is? I'm going to give $20,000. So people will see, right? And you also put, it's given by Brother Jamal of Jamal Juicy Dates. Are you going to put that on the announcement? Because it would be good for business as well. And it's a, uh, there's a lot of doctors there. Shah might get some investors here. No. What do you do? A moment of intention, right? It's okay. I'll give the money, but I'll give it secretly, for example. Or I'll give it publicly, but you're careful to make your intention, right? So that your outward action and your inward correspond. That you do the right thing outwardly, but you're careful to make the inward accord with it. That's inactions. But also, now it's more difficult. That's number six. Number seven, and and to be true in the like of khawf, meaning in the like of the fear of Allah right? for it to be strong and plentiful and likewise in all the traits of the heart right? because every trait just as we are obligated to pray fast give zakat and do good right? of the outward actions they're actions of the heart that Allah has made obligatory for us. And they're also obligatory. So what do you have to do with them? Right? You have to fulfill, and they're more testing. How much 
fear of Allah is enough. Is there a quantity? That okay, if you have this much fear, you're fine. Right? So the believer should always, uh, the true believer should be always uh, that is striving to have plentiful fear of Allah, hope in Allah, love of Allah, gratitude to Allah, shukr, right? Plentiful trust in Allah. These inward qualities, the sign of them being true is that you're consistently thinking about those praiseworthy qualities, right? The ones mentioned in the fourth quarter, for example, of the Ihya Fiam al Ghazali. Right? So we covered that in our Thursday revival circle, right? Those qualities, a sign of being true as a servant of Allah, that these qualities are things that you are striving to make strong and Plentiful. No day should pass except that you're thinking about hope and fear, khauf and raja. Right? You're thinking about sabr and shukr. You're thinking about tawakkul upon Allah. You're thinking about your certitude in Allah, your love of Allah. Right? Your yearning, your shok for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all these different qualities. You're, you're always trying to deepen them. And make them regular parts of your life. That's part of being true servant of Allah. Why? Some of the early Muslims, when they talk about Shu'abul Iman, the branches of faith, they call these qualities of the heart as being Awsaful Iman. These are the qualities of faith. Right? Faith is not only what you believe, but it's also how you believe. And how you believe. So then Imam Al Birgivi Rahimahullah says, Was Siddiqu Bani Tasafa bihadi al Ausafi Jamia. And the Siddiq, which is Kathiru Siddiq, the one who is truly true. Who says Mukhtar Holland translated the Siddiq as being a champion of truth. It's a bit of a colorful. Translation. Others said, using slightly higher English, in a sense, that the Siddiq is the truly veracious, right? Someone who is fully true, right? Fully true meaning they have all these seven aspects of being true. True in word, right? true in word, true in intention, true in promises, true in one's resolve, True in fulfilling one's promises and resolve, true in one's actions, and true in the qualities of one's heart. All of these. And the qualities of the heart are of two types. There are your, your akhlaq ma'allah, the qualities of your heart, how you are with Allah, and there's also how you are with people. Right? Which is that when you show your concern for somebody, it's not just words, you mean it. That you have care. Right? Like you're not saying, someone falls down, you're like, what a loser. And say, are you okay? Right? Why? Because other people can see you. You say, are you okay? But inside you're like, what a loser. Why does he keep falling down? Right? No, but that, that you have genuine concern. Or you ask somebody, um, do you need any help? And you're like, I hope he doesn't say yes. Right? Right? So that you be true in these qualities. Why? Because you know that you need to have good opinion of people. You have to have concern for people. You have to have shafaqa, a caring concern, etc. So these are these qualities, right? Then there's one Final aspect, and these are encompassing virtues, so we're taking more time than we normally do with these. There's one key thing that we're going to look at in the next class, which is how do you acquire these virtues? Imam al Birgivi doesn't spend a long time on it, but he gives us a map of how you hold yourself to virtue. So he says, right, that then 
you one of the encompassing virtues he says is al murabata right is to set a commitment for yourself and this is how change happens right how change happens and we're going to look at that bismillah ta'ala in the next class and it needs a little bit of unpacking that how do you change right and he mentions the three classical elements of change which is musharata that you make a commitment number 1 number 2 then you are you watch over yourself which is muraqaba you make a commitment for example you make a commitment that i'm going to start doing my emphasized sunnahs daily for all five prayers i'm going to do the emphasized sunnah well there's four because asr doesn't have an emphasized sunnah it has a recommended sunnah i'm going to do my emphasized sunnahs right there are only four daily right there 12 rakats and the promise is you know a castle in paradise for whoever does these 12 rakats daily so i'm going to do it but it's only wishful thing i'm going to do it but how do you make sure you make a commitment don't just make a general resolve right so we'll look at these three elements you make a condition a firm commitment and we'll see how you make a firm commitment then you make muraqaba you watch over yourself so uh, you make a thing after every prayer you think back you look back or you make a checklist so you make a check mark okay this prayer i did it so you come to maghrib and you hadn't prayed the sunnah of zuhur what do you do about it do you make istighfar for not fulfilling your commitment because seeking forgiveness is not only from sins but here you fell short of your commitment So you make istighfar. It's understood from the Sunnah that if you miss something of your routine, you make it up. Not because it's a religious duty to make it up, but to stick to one's routine. Say the Aisha relates that of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's night worship. That if anything of his night routine was not fully done, he would do it after sunrise. And it's not qada. It's not a legal making up. but it's so that you maintain your routine of turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we we'll look at that aspect and thirdly you take yourself to account muhasaba how do you take yourself to account but taking yourself to account is not to put yourself down you didn't do it so i'm such a loser no this is a positive taking yourself to account so you make sure that you rectify your action going forward So these are th- the three elements of change and he adds to it some other elements which w- which we'll look at as well right of al muataba wal muaqaba is to blame oneself and to punish oneself but these have to be done carefully right done carefully i know somebody who i noticed was walking with a lot of discomfort and he and i share a like of good shoes so you're going to have shoes make make them comfortable so what so he said because whenever i break my routine i put little pebbles in my shoes I said why so i read in a book that you have to punish yourself the question is how right how right how right you don't punish yourself by harming yourself right but there's a way he says oh but he read this he read in such and such book risal al qushaisar so and so would wear woolen clothing in winter and he says oh and one of the other people righteous people used to wear sheep skin in the summer inside out so the hair of the sheep skin was against his skin he said did anyone say to do that Says no. Says is this from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Says no. Right. So you have to be careful, right? And that's one of the dangers in our time. A lot of you need. There's a general practice of the religion. It applies to everybody. There are things that are mentioned in the books. Sometimes they're mentioned. Anything. كل ما خرج من من الأصل. Right. 
anything that goes against the general practice of our religion, you need to make sure you're understanding it correctly. Right? So something is mentioned, the biography of someone righteous. They didn't eat salt for 40 years. Is it sunnah not to eat salt? No. So we say, wow, he had high himma. Is it sunnah to follow the person? No. We don't object. That's between them and Allah. We say, mashallah, they had high result. What do I do about it? Go ask somebody. Right? Now, unless you have high blood pressure or your doctor tells you reduce your sodium, there's no reward in not having salt. You make your wife's life difficult. Say, please don't put salt in my food. Why? Because so-and-so of the Salaf did not have salt. Now she starts disliking the Salaf. So who are those people? Astaghfirullah. <laughs> no. And there's a way to practice one's religion, right? That's why do it yourself. Islam is self-inflicted harm, right? Is do it yourself. Islam is self-inflicted harm. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Fasalu ahla zikr in kuntum lata. Ask the people of remembrance if you know not. You read something spectacular. So and so left his work and his family and went on a 12 year journey. And his name is Imam Ghazali. So, oh wow, I should do that. You quit your job, leave your family. It would be criminal. Because what you didn't read is Imam Al Ghazali had the permission of his family, the support of his family, and he made arrangements for his family to be taken care of fully. For the whole period of time. And your family might not, may well not quite be like Imam al Ghazali's family in their sabr. Right? So anything like that, you read it, say, mashallah. Don't object to it because you don't, maybe you don't understand. But don't try to implement anything that's not within the normal, the general practice of religious Muslims. What do you do? They say, I don't know. Find out. Very simple. Right? Very simple. And what you find with scholars of great learning, you ask them a question, so that's an excellent question. I don't know the answer. I haven't thought about it. I'll get back to you. Very common. The most learned scholars. Which is why Imam Malik used to say, لَقِّنُوا أَصْحَابَكُمْ قَوْلَ لَا أَدْرِي Teach your companions, say, I don't know. Not out of being weak, it's actually being strong. Because you want to act on something, find out what's the right way of acting upon it. Okay? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that what we've seen today to be you know, one of the greatest of virtues in our religion is Sidq. Right? Is to be true. And this is one of the qualities of the Prophets. The Prophet was known as Sadiq al Amin in these qualities. And we should make a commitment to be exceedingly careful in our words and our actions and all the matters mentioned. Next week, we're going to look at this, how to change our condition. Right? And we're going to break it down because it's very, very important. وَصَلَّى ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. We have a couple of questions. There's a question online that um, I, I struggle with promises uh, because I find myself breaking them. Very simple. Make less promises. You don't have to make a promise. Someone says, I'm inviting all my friends for dinner. Can you come? Say, yeah, sure, I'll be there. Say, I'd love to come. But let me check. Let me check. I'll get back to you. Simple. I'm really bad with using calendars. Terrible. So I always would have someone else make my bookings for Jumu'ah. So at Cooper's, the Imam, wonderful guy, used to be my mother's neighbor, Imam Nafis. He asked me, Sheikh Faraz, are you available next week? I'm traveling. Could you give the khutbah? I said, uh, could, you, could you text uh, Brother Yasir? Because he does my book. He said, Sheikh, you're right here. Just check your calendar. So I opened my calendar and said, yes, I'm available. <laughs> Imam Nafkas standing next to me. I, I had my calendar. He said, Sheikh Faraz, it says you're booked. I said, Imam Nafis, that's exactly why. I said, please don't. You know, I'm not good at doing this. right? But at least I had the calendar. The reason I had it open in front of him, because 
I'm not good with reading the kites. I was doing it in a way that he could see it. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> he saw that I was booked. Once I booked myself for three Jumars at the same time. Because they insisted, can you please come? I said, I, I'm not sure. I said, no, no, please. And they booked me. I didn't even, but I didn't actually agree. They put it anyway. In Jordan, they said, Bil Khawa. They insisted. So if you're not, I just double check. Right? So that's one thing. I find myself breaking promises. That's a sign that you make too many promises. Or try harder. Because very often it's our laziness. For example, you're tired. So oh, my back is hurting. I can't go help him move. Show up. Right? Show up. Maybe you can't help them move, but you said you'll be there. So maybe take, you know, drop off a brunch for them. Grab your, you know, <laughs> grab your son and daughter to help them move a little bit. If they're a little bit older, whatever. So that's, that's a question. There's another question that what does it mean to be True, when our, in our states, right? it's what the author mentioned, to be true in our states with Allah, through the qualities of the heart, that we're trying to cultivate the meanings of those qualities. And the ulama cautioned, if you're not careful about the qualities of your heart, you may be in a bad state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If, you're, if you're not trying to have hope and fear, if you're not trying to have Patience and gratitude. You're not trying to have tawakkul, yaqeen, right? Mahabba, these qualities. This is what iman is, right? Which is why Abu Hassan al Shadili, radiallahu ta'ala, says, مَن لَمْ يَتَغَلْغَلْ فِي عِلْمِنَا هَذَا مَا تَمُصِرًا عَلَى الْكَبَائِرِ وَهُوَ لَا يَشْعُرْ Whoever doesn't become deeply immersed in this knowledge of ours dies committing major sins and they're unaware. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never just tells us to do things only. He always commands us to be a certain way. And inevitably, the outward commands are connected with how you are with Allah. Right? About Allah is ma sadiqeen. Yuhibbul muhsineen. He loves those who do good. All these qualities the people of tawakkul, all these qualities, they're always praised. Because just as you're commanded to do certain things, you're also commanded by your Lord to be a certain way. If you're not concerned about that, there's a chance that you may not be fulfilling that command. Right? And how do you do that? To pay attention to learning about the health of your heart. Right? Go ahead. You rectify, you rectify. Right? And sometimes rectification requires taking means, right? Re requires taking means. The Salaf rectified in amazing ways, right? It's mentioned in the books on, you know, the on avidness for seeking knowledge. Some of the ulama, what they used to do, that before their class started, they used to close their gates. So, if you didn't come early, you couldn't come in. Now, forget if you weren't, if you're late, like in our time, people just show up, whatever. No, if you weren't early, you wouldn't get in. So, some students of knowledge, they got to the place and <laughs> the gates were closed. Of course, sand. So, they dug a tunnel <laughs> under the wall to the other side and came through. Okay. Now that, you know, the ulama said, but that's mushkil because you're not allowed to do that in someone else's property. They say no, because they probably had, they were reasonably sure that the sheikh would not mind. There's a problem. How could you dig under someone's property? But they did all kinds of things, right? Of seriousness in rectifying, right? Of seriousness in rectifying, right? What be Follow. Any bad with the with the appropriate equivalent good to wipe it out, and what's the the essay any bad 
any bad, which is whether sin or wrongdoing or shortcoming, they say the, the good that takes care of the bad is something that is equivalent and extra to do the wiping. right? Because you left a hole, so first you have to fill the hole, and then you have to polish. So you have to do that little bit extra. What's the extra you have to do? Right? And it should be appropriate to the action, right? Like some people, what they do, you know, they they said, okay, um, you know, they committed to give khutbah on Friday, they didn't show up. So say, Sheikh, I apologize. As an apology, I'm taking you for mensaf. What's the relationship between mensaf and not giving the Friday khutbah? Right? Right? So you have to think of what's the proper equivalent correction. Right? And what's the proper equivalent apology? Right? Because sometimes the apology is worse than the original error. Right? Like one of the shiuch, someone promised to do something for them, then at a dars, the guy came with an expensive jacket. Sheikhna, this is for you. And he put it on for the sheikh in front of everybody. And the sheikh, everybody knew, was very poor. It looked like someone's doing a favor for him. And the shiuch don't like fancy gifts. They don't accept gifts just like that. Because they try to keep their independence. That's totally an appropriate way of apologizing for something else, right? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to facilitate. Wa